So, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here to the Edward M. Kennedy uh, Institute. <coughs> My name is Michael Lonergan. and I'm the Deputy Irish Ambassador to the United States. But before this, I had a much, much better job and title. I was Consul General here in Boston, and it's truly wonderful to look out and see so many familiar friends and faces uh, here in the, in the audience. Um, this is a very, very special occasion, and I'm so glad to see so many uh, uh, friends and supporters of, of uh, Ireland uh, and uh, the entire island here in this, in this room. Uh, we are here to mark the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, and we've put together a really interesting panel of very distinguished speakers uh, for you here this evening. Um, my job is basically just to say a few housekeeping rules. First of all, most importantly, to turn off all your cell phones. Um, and secondly, to say that you should have got question cards to fill in, and if you want to ask a question of the audience, uh, a question to the panel, if you fill those out and pass them forward, we'll get to those towards the, uh, towards the end. Um, just to say very briefly at the, at the outset, uh, it's obviously a matter of great uh, regret and concern to the Irish government and to the British government and to the United States and to all the parties in Northern Ireland that at the moment uh, we do not have the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement functioning in Belfast as they should be. But I don't think this should in any way take away from what we are commemorating here this evening. What we are commemorating here this evening is the singular achievement of the Good Friday Agreement of 25 years of peace and progress in Northern Ireland. Um, the parties at different times in the last number of months have been tantalizingly close to reaching agreement to get the executive back up and running. Uh, we all remain firmly of the view that this is only a matter of time. It's a question of when, not if. And when that happens, the Good Friday Agreement will remain the linchpin, the blueprint, the roadmap for the future of Northern Ireland, for the people of Northern Ireland to be governed uh, by the politicians that they elect, uh, representing the entire community. And therefore, in no sense, I think, are these commemorations, Good Friday Agreement, like an oration over an empty grave. They are very much celebrating a huge achievement that would not have been possible without the relationship between Ireland, Britain, and particularly the United States. And in that context, it's a particular honor to welcome uh, somebody whose uh, place in the history of Ireland will always stand in the highest setting, Senator George Mitchell. <clears throat> now, I, 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 have, I have to tell you, Senator Mitchell is being earning his crust because I, I, two weeks ago he was on a similar panel at the Library of Congress with the Taoiseach and some other guests. I know earlier this week he was in Connecticut with the Irish ambassador, and I know that next week he's down in Georgetown, and no doubt he's in many other places in and out between. So he's certainly been kept busy on this anniversary roadshow, and we certainly appreciate him joining us uh, here this evening. I also want to thank uh, one of the great uh, Irish Americans and very much the voice of America in Ireland, uh, Kevin Cullen from the Boston Globe, for joining us and moderating. Thank you very much, Kevin. <clears throat> um, I also want to particularly thank the staff and the board of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute uh, who have done such a great job and been such amazing hosts and we've so enjoyed working with them and thank you for all that you have, you have done. Um, for me personally, I want to say it's great to be here. I was actually here when, as we say in Ireland, we turned the sod when we broke ground on this building uh, back in 2013. And in fact, I was a guest of Marty Meehan's at the inaugural dinner at the Fairmont Copley for the first round of the fundraising. So it's great to be here in this magnificent uh, uh, building and to see it come to uh, come to fruition. And in that context, I'd like to say a brief word about Senator Kennedy. My first day as Consul General in Boston was the day of Senator Kennedy's funeral. And for those of us who were here that day, I don't think we'll ever forget it, not least because the rain never stopped falling. And one of those occasions which you often get in Ireland where you feel that nature is in sympathy with the occasion you're at. And after the funeral, myself and the Irish Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, and a few friends, including Congressman Meehan and Capuano and Neil, repaired to uh, an establishment on Boylston Street, and we did what Irish people do so well when they're sad. There were some songs, there were a few drinks, and it turned into an Irish wake. Uh, and at various, and at various points, at various points, Marty Meehan would say, "Ted would have loved this," you know. So it was, it was a bittersweet uh, way to remember it. So it's wonderful to be here in this institution and remember it. It, it very much underlines the role that Senator Kennedy played back in the dark and difficult days of the peace process back in the 1970s, where he really spearheaded the US involvement, and in particular, his championing of his great friendship with 
uh, John Hume, and I know John's son, Aidan, is here in the audience uh, the, this evening, uh, Aidan. So thank you so much, Aidan, for joining us. <clears throat> uh, uh, very briefly, I'd like to thank our sponsors, right, which is, wouldn't be possible. I'd like to thank my good colleague, uh, Shane Cahill, at the Irish Consulate. I want to thank uh, Harriet Cross and her colleagues at the British Consulate. I want to thank uh, uh, Cahill and Victoria and all the good people at Irish Network Boston who do an amazing job here flying the flag. Uh, Norman Houston and Richard at the Northern Ireland Bureau. And finally, the Meehan Foundation. Thank you for all your support, right, which this event wouldn't be possible. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce one of the, uh, another great friend of Ireland and a great uh, and gracious friend of the embassies in Washington, D.C., Mrs. Vicki Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, and welcome. Welcome back. We're so delighted to have you. And good evening to all of you. And on behalf of our president, Mary Grant, and our chairman, Jim Karam, I am so proud to welcome all of you to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. We are so honored to have you here to celebrate 20 years of peace and progress in Northern Ireland. And tonight, we celebrate the spirit of trust and hope that helped to end the violence in Northern Ireland and to begin the endless possibilities that come with the future. I want to say a special thank you to the Consulate General of Ireland, the British Consulate General of Boston, and to Irish Network Boston for organizing this special event. I also want to congratulate UMass President Marty Meehan for the work he has done, first as Chancellor of UMass Lowell, and now as President of the University of Massachusetts System to develop and promote educational opportunities and cooperation between and among all of our countries. Thank you, Marty. As I am sure everyone in this room knows, almost 40 million Americans are of Irish descent. So it is no accident that America has an abiding interest in the island of Ireland and in the current generation, an abiding commitment to peace and justice in Northern Ireland. As I was thinking about this evening and this wonderful program, I knew that there was no more fitting place to host this evening than the institute that bears my late husband's name, that proud Irish American, Senator Edward M. Kennedy. Ted's connection and commitment and that of the rest of the Kennedy family to the island of Ireland was unwavering. During his time in the US Senate, he welcomed many leaders from Northern Ireland, leaders in politics, business, and the community, and was honored to visit with them in Northern Ireland as well. Ted loved to tell the story of his increased involvement and awakening, really, to the issues in Northern Ireland. He spoke with great admiration about his many meetings and conversations with John Hume. Aidan, I am so happy that you're here with us this evening. My husband and your father became very close friends, and I was honored to be called friends, both your mother and father as well. As Ted recalled in a speech he gave in Derry in 1998, John Hume because of his encouragement, Ted joined forces with three other Irish American elected officials, Speaker Tip O'Neill of Massachusetts, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan of New York, and Governor Hugh Carey of New York, to condemn the support of violence that was coming from the United States, and to insist that dollars from America must never be used to kill innocent men and women and children in Northern Ireland. And so, Ted said, the four horsemen were born. And over the years, they acted together on many occasions to do what they could to advance a peaceful resolution of the conflict. And that was the beginning of a relationship that led to substantial engagement by the United States in the north of Ireland. John Hume and Ted Kennedy not only liked each other, they trusted each other. And I use the word trust deliberately. 
As we reflect on the events that culminated on April 10, 1998, with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, that is a word you will hear often. And that's a word that leads me to our keynote speaker tonight. If you have read our speaker's book, Making Peace, which I hope you have, then you realize the importance of trust when it came to the negotiations. And trust is what has brought us to this point. It took tremendous courage, resilience, and trust for all the parties in Northern Ireland to work together to come to an agreement that everyone could embrace. It also took courage, resilience, and trust on behalf of the governments of Ireland, Great Britain, and the United States. And it took courage, personal sacrifice, and unwavering commitment to the task at hand for our keynote speaker to listen to everyone and facilitate the seemingly impossible. This extraordinary man managed to shepherd a process that resulted in two governments and eight political parties committing to peace, political stability, and reconciliation in Northern Ireland. But if you know his history, it really is not that surprising. As a former US attorney, a federal judge, the majority leader of the United States Senate, sitting right now in his old seat, selected six years in a row by a bipartisan group of senators who really don't agree on that much, but they said he was the most respected member in that august body. Our key note speaker is a born leader who knows how to build consensus even among disparate groups in the United States Senate. After retiring from the Senate, he answered the call to serve as chairman of the International Commission on Disarmament in Northern Ireland and later as chair of the subsequent peace negotiations that culminated in the Good Friday Agreement. He's been awarded the Philadelphia Liberty Medal, the Truman Institute Peace Prize, the German Peace Prize, the UNESCO Peace Prize, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom, to name a few. He is shown by the witness of his own life that public service is a noble profession and that one man can indeed make a difference. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming him now, my friend, Ted Kennedy's friend, Senator George Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicki, for those kind words to you, to President Meehan, President Grant, Ambassador Derrick, the Consuls General, and the many distinguished guests and friends here. Uh, it's an honor for me to participate uh, in this event. Vicki, it, it is with a deep and moving sense of emotion that I listen to your words, and as I did so, pictured in my mind your husband, Ted, standing over here, loud voice, defending the principles and values of our society, and at the same time, reaching across the aisle in a manner that I think is less understood and appreciated than it should be. Uh, Ted was, for me, a mentor, a friend, a great representative of the people of Massachusetts and of the country. And I think historians will judge one of the most effective legislators in our nation's history. He was associated with directly as the author or co-sponsor or a major contributor more significant legislation than any other senator in my lifetime and I believe in our nation's history. 
And so as Americans, we all have a debt uh, to Ted Kennedy. And I ask you to join me in a round of applause and recognition of Ted Kennedy, the great American. <laughs> Now, as, as Vicki mentioned, I speak often, and in this season of the 20th anniversary of Good Friday Agreement, every day at least once. So frankly, for me, having heard myself talk so much, the highlight of the program is the introduction. <laughs> for me, everything else is downhill after that. Uh, it's always nice to hear pleasant things said about yourself, especially in front of a group of strangers who don't know any better. <laughs> the risk, of course, is that if you hear it often enough, you may begin to believe it. So I like to begin with a story about introductions and an occasion on which I was brought back down to earth. After I finished my service in Northern Ireland, I returned to my home in Maine and wrote a book about that experience. When it was published, I went on a book promotion tour around the country. I received many invitations, and in that process, I learned the interesting fact that in the United States, there are more Irish-American organizations than there are Irish-Americans. <laughs> and every one of those groups asked me to come and speak. I couldn't go to all, but I did go to many. And as I traveled the country, there developed among these Irish-American groups an informal competition as who could give the longest most fantastic, frequently quite ridiculous introductions of me. <laughs> the proper reaction, of course, would for me to have shown some humility, to ask them to please keep it short. I had an improper reaction. I loved it. <laughs> I encouraged them. I scolded them when they left something out. In Chicago, a guy got up and for a half hour read just read a list of everything I'd ever done in my life. And the most interesting part of it was much of it I'd not been aware of until he announced <laughs> it uh, that day. So by the time I got to the last stop on this book tour, it was in Stamford, Connecticut, the Amer Irish American Society there. I was overly impressed with myself. I had a hard time squeezing my head through the front door. But when I got in, the first person I encountered was an elderly woman who rushed up to me, very nervous and excited, shook my hand vigorously, spent several minutes heaping praise on me, telling me how great I am. And then she said, I don't live anywhere near here. I drove across the entire state of Connecticut over three hours just to meet you, to shake your hand, ask you, please, would you autograph my poster? And I said, of course I will. And so she handed me the poster, a big photograph, a pen. I looked at it. I said, I'm happy to sign it. I said, but before I do, I think there's something I should tell you. She said, what is it? I said, I'm not Henry Kissinger. <laughs> it was a picture of Kissinger. She, she said, you're not? Well, who are you anyway? And when I told her, she said, why, that's just terrible. She said, I drove three hours to meet a great man named Kissinger, and all I've got is a nobody like you, a guy I never heard of. I said, I'm sorry you feel so bad. I wish there's something I could do to make you feel better. After a few seconds, she said, well, there is. When I asked what it was, she leaned forward, I leaned forward, we were kind of in a conspiratorial mode, and she said, nobody will ever know the difference. <laughs> she said, would you mind signing Henry Kissinger's name to my poster? <laughs> so I did. And it's hanging today in her living room in eastern Connecticut, a daily reminder to me to enjoy these nice introductions, but don't take them too seriously. Well, let me speak for a few minutes about the Good Friday Agreement. When I announced it uh, 20 years ago next week, I described it as an historic achievement, and it was. But I also said on that same day that by itself, the agreement did not guarantee peace or political stability or reconciliation. It made them possible. But achieving and sustaining the lofty goals of the agreement would require the vision and courage 
that the leaders of Northern Ireland in 1998 demonstrated for other future leaders in Northern Ireland. And I hope that the current leaders of Northern Ireland, of Ireland, of the United Kingdom, and of the European Union, as they today reflect on their responsibilities and deal with the difficult issues they confront, will look back 20 years to what their predecessors were able to do. Much has been said and written about the long and difficult road that led to the Good Friday Agreement. And many have deservedly received credit for their roles. Prime Minister Bertie Ahern and his predecessors, Albert Reynolds and John Bruton, Prime Minister Blair and his predecessor, John Major, they and their governments laid the foundation for the negotiations and then brought those negotiations to a successful conclusion. They were ably assisted by a truly brilliant group of career officials on both sides. And one of them is here today, former Ambassador Sean O'Higgin, a dear friend. And I want to ask Sean to stand not only for his individual role, which was enormous, but in a capacity representing the many others who, like him, devoted large parts of their lives to bringing this conflict to an end. Sean, would you please stand and be recognized? In the United States, President Bill Clinton was the first American president to make peace in Northern Ireland a central objective of his administration. In the Congress, Senator Kennedy, along with Senators Dodd and Moynihan, with Speaker Tip O'Neill, Richie Neal, and many other members of the House of Representatives, Marty Meehan was there at the time as well, all played a big role in shaping American policy in support of those negotiations. Ted was especially well informed, deeply concerned about the conflict in Northern Ireland. And for all of the years that I served there, Ted was a valuable source of support, advice, and guidance. But I think we can all acknowledge that the real heroes of the Good Friday Agreement were the people and the political leaders of Northern Ireland. In dangerous and difficult circumstances, after lifetimes devoted to conflict, they summoned extraordinary courage and vision, and they reached agreement. At great risk and cost to themselves, their families, their political careers. Today, in our country and across the Western world, it's fashionable to demean, to insult, to ridicule political leaders. And certainly, much of it is deserved. But we don't pay enough attention, give enough recognition or tribute to those political leaders who do dare greatly and succeed. In Northern Ireland, these were ordinary men and women. But after 700 days of failure, they joined in one day of success, and they changed the course of history. Sometime after the agreement was reached, I agreed to serve as the chancellor of the Queen's University of Belfast in Northern Ireland, a position I held for 10 years. It enabled me to return to Northern Ireland often, which I enjoy because I love the place and the people. They're energetic, productive, and a pleasure to be with. Now, it's true, they can be argumentative, and they're very quick to take offense. As the late David Irvine, a great man and a dear friend, loudly said to me on the first day of negotiations, 
Senator, he said, if you are to be of any use to us, you must understand one thing about the people of Northern Ireland. What is it, I asked? And he replied, we in Northern Ireland would drive 100 miles out of our way to receive an insult. <laughs> well, he was right, but nobody's perfect. The current problems in Northern Ireland are difficult and serious and must be resolved. But at the same time, we should not hold Northern Ireland to a higher standard than we apply to ourselves and to others. Every society, including the United States, the United Kingdom, and Ireland, has social and political problems. Just two weeks ago, I was in Northern Ireland. I was asked by a television reporter, isn't this political dysfunction in Northern Ireland a terrible thing? I said, well, I just came from the United States. <laughs> I don't think I'm in a position to lecture anybody about political dysfunction. And the guy standing in line waiting to be interviewed behind me was from the UK. I said, and neither can he. <laughs> what we must do is to reaffirm to the people and the leaders of Northern Ireland our continuing involvement, our strong and unwavering encouragement and support, our trade, our tourism, our investment, all as tangible evidence of our deep and continuing concern and devotion. We must strongly urge a Brexit outcome that does not reestablish a hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. And the governments of both the United States and the United Kingdom must avoid economic decisions that cost jobs and create hardship in Northern Ireland. My service in Northern Ireland changed my life, so I want to close with some personal comments. Whatever our politics today, whatever our heritage of the past, we're proud and fortunate to be Americans, citizens of a society that, despite its many serious imperfections, remains to me still the most free the most open, the most just society in all of human history. We have much to be concerned about, but much more to be thankful for. My father's parents were born in Ireland. Late in the 19th century, they became part of one of the great migrations in human history as millions crossed the Atlantic in search of freedom and opportunity in the new world. Many succeeded, many did not. My father was born here in Boston, but he never knew his parents. His mother died, his father couldn't care for the children, so my father was raised in an orphanage run by Catholic nuns at the intersection of Huntington and Massachusetts Avenues. After several years, he was adopted by an elderly, childless couple who were not Irish and who lived in a small town in Maine. He had little schooling, and he worked a long, hard life as a laborer, ending up as a janitor at a local school. My mother was an immigrant from Lebanon. She could not read or write, and she spent 50 years working the night shift in textile mills. My parents were very poor and died penniless. But in their minds, they were successful because each of their children got an education. And then thanks to the openness of this great American society, each of us has lived a life far beyond our parents' imagination. My father was a quiet man. He rarely spoke, and he never spoke about his childhood. On the morning I was to leave home to go away to college, he sat me down at our kitchen table. He was wearing his work clothes. My mother had just returned from work on the night shift, and she was 
covered with lint. My father said to me, you're a smart young boy. I know you're going to do well. Now, he said, I want you to take a good look at me. Take a good look at your mother. And wherever you go, whatever you do, don't you ever forget where you came from. I never have. I don't know most of you personally, but I'm certain that in this room, there are many similar stories. We all stand on the shoulders and of our parents and grandparents, many of whom overcame hostility, stereotyping, insults, and discrimination. They got their hands on the bottom ladder of success, the bottom rung of the ladder of success in America, and they pulled themselves up, and in the process, they lifted us up. I hope that each of you will never forget where you came from. My father had no sense of his Irish heritage. I never heard him say the word Ireland. So when President Clinton asked me to go to Northern Ireland, I too lacked any sense of my heritage. But after the years working on the peace process and then serving as Chancellor of Queens, after traveling all over that beautiful island, I have come to know and love Ireland and its people. I've been blessed to make many friends, to be warmly received in Northern Ireland, in Ireland, and in the Irish American community. Many have thanked me for my work in Northern Ireland, including many of you just before we came into this room. My response it is, is that it is I who should be grateful and I am, for the Irish have filled an inner void that existed within me that I didn't even know was there. I am an American, very proud of it, but a large part of my heart and of my emotions will forever be with the people of Northern Ireland and Ireland. And I pray that God will bless them with peace, prosperity, and reconciliation. Thank you all very much for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Mitchell. President Clinton, I think, has said on record that the best decision of his presidency was sending George Mitchell to Belfast, and the proudest day of his presidency was the day the Good Friday Agreement was signed. And I think all of us who have been privileged enough to hear Senator Mitchell's speech uh, can know exactly what President Clinton was talking about. So thank you again so much. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, Sharon Quinn, who is go Shannon Quinn, I beg your pardon, who's going to provide a reading of Porrick Otuma's poem, Shaking Hands. We decided to create history by having an Irish event who didn't quote Yeats or Heaney. Uh, uh, this, this must be historic. But this is a very, very clever poem, and I would urge you all to listen to it very carefully, because I think this poem underlines the sense of the importance of gesture and the importance of goodwill and the importance of generosity, uh, qualities that are needed now more than, more than ever, and not just on the island of Ireland. Um, Shannon is a J1 visa student from Cookstown in Northern Ireland where she's studying communications, advertising and marketing and she's currently on a year out working here for Norbella in Boston South End on an internship which sounds a lot more fun than studying back in Belfast if you ask me. Um, and when Shannon finishes speaking I would ask our panel to take their seats on the front row. Thank you very much.
Shaking Hands by Porik Otuma. Because what's the alternative? Because of courage. Because of loved ones lost. Because no more. Because it's a small thing, shaking hands. It happens every day. Because I heard of one man whose hands haven't stopped shaking since a market day in Oma. Because it takes a second to say hate. But it takes longer, much longer, to be a great leader. Much, much longer. Because shared space without human touching doesn't amount to much. Because it's easier to speak to your own than to hold the hand of someone whose side has previously been described, proscribed, denied. Because it is tough. Because it is tough. Because it is meant to be tough. And this is the stuff of memory, the stuff of hope, the stuff of gesture and meaning and leading because it has taken so, so long, because it has taken land and money and languages and barrels and barrels of blood and grieving, because lives have been lost, and because lives have been taken, because to be bereaved is to be troubled by grief, because more than two troubled people live here, because I know a woman whose hand hasn't been shaken since she was a man, because shaking a, pa a hand is only a part of the start. Because I know a woman whose touch calmed a man whose heart was breaking. Because privilege is not to be taken lightly. Because this just might be good. Because who said this would be easy? Because some people love what you stand for. And for some, if you can, they can. Because solidar solidarity means a common hand because a hand is only a hand, so hang on to it. So join your much discussed hands. We need this for one small second. So touch and so lead. Thank you. Kevin Cullen. Uh, I'm a foreign correspondent at the Boston Globe. I cover Dorchester. Um, that went over well. As our uh, panelists take their seat, I just wanted to begin the remarks tonight by noting that it was 50 years ago this week that Martin Luther King was assassinated. And um, with Aiden here, it made me remem remember a story the first time I walked into John Hume's office in Derry. I had black hair, and Aiden was a boy. And the first thing I noticed when I opened the door and walked in and John was there was a, a huge portrait of Martin Luther King Jr. on the wall. And John talked about the importance of King. And um, you know, I think many people in this room know that the Catholic Civil Rights Movement in Northern Ireland was very much fashioned on the civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King Jr. And unfortunately in Ireland, um, nonviolence quickly gave way to violence, which is why we're here tonight to talk. But I just thought it'd be important to, to remember Dr. King and also to remember John Hume, um, who I consider the architect of the peace process. Now George, you told me because you gave a speech, I was not to ask you a question, but you know I'm a journalist and I don't care what politicians say, so I wanted to ask you, I'm just back there myself, I was in, I was in the North last week, and the one thing I, I got a sense from people is that sometimes we minimize that by the end of the, the conflict, 100 people were being killed every year on average, so in those 20 years, that means there are 20,000 people walking around, or, or 2,000 people who are walking around who wouldn't have been and those 2,000 people had children, and they had children. That's extraordinary. And yet, as you said, do you remember the day after the agreement on Good, on Good Saturday, you and I had a cup of coffee in the Stormont Hotel? And I remember the only difference is you said, Heather, your wife, wanted you to come home. And my wife, Martha, asked me if I could stay a few extra weeks. 
I'll leave that there. I add one thing to that yeah. figure of five. It has been remarked by many historians and analysts that the total number of deaths in Northern Ireland, while horrific in absolute numbers, was not as large as the numbers of deaths in other conflicts around the world over a similar span. Yeah. But they almost always ignore the fact that in Northern Ireland, there was a brutal process which came to be known as punishment beatings, mm -hmm. in which people who in other societies might have been killed were severely and permanently maimed in a way that would cripple or incapacitate them for life. And there were, by a factor of 10, more of those than were killed. So the casualties of the conflict were extremely high. Mm. And it remains today a tremendous festering wound because many of these were young men who've lived, those who survived, have been permanently maimed, sometimes physically unable and often mentally unable to care for themselves. And so it was a very, very difficult conflict. And while it is true that thousands of people are alive today, and that's significant, it is also true that there are tens of thousands who are healthy who might not otherwise be. It's also true that this all took place in a, pl at a, at a place roughly the size of Connecticut, and that you could, um, not only did you lose a family member, but you would often walk by that same place, and it, this, the psychic wounds were deeper. But let me just ask you, because I, I got this sense talking to people, and you said it that day when we sat there and had a pretty lousy cup of coffee, as I recall, at the Stormont Hotel. They can't make coffee there. I um, see how good a memory you, you have. Who was the other reporter that was there? Do you remember? How you don't? Don it was Carter Steve Clary. Lynch of USA Today. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't yeah. remember that. Um, you have a better memory than me. Um, but no, I, the sense that, and you, you mentioned that, that this, will, this, this has a chance to bring peace. It has. It's been wildly successful on that front. The dissidents are just a bunch of guys hanging around with no support whatsoever. Um, there obviously is some gangsterism, but frankly, there's more gangsterism in Dublin. And yet, when we get to the reconciliation part and we get to the integration part, in those 20 years, do you think we've, has it moved less than you hope, particularly on the integration? So the reality is most people live among each other. They don't go to school with each other. They, right. th there's not a lot of integration. I had relatively low expectations in that regard, and they have been met. The reason for my low expectations was that before I went to Northern Ireland, I spent a great deal of time in the Balkans. And I have a very clear image of a day in which I went to a small town right on the border of Croatia and Bosnia, which before the conflict had been half Serb and half Croat. At the outset of the conflict, the Serbian militia came to the town, the Serbs in the town joined with them, and they defeated and expelled the Croats, and in an act of pure vengeance, burned down virtually every building in the town owned by a Croat. 18 months later, the tide of war changed, and exactly the reverse happened. So by the time I got there, there was not a, an unscathed building in the town. Much of it was destroyed. And I asked the young mayor, young man, 35, a very sharp young guy, how long will it be before Serbs and Croats can live together side by side in peace in this town? He said to me, Senator, we will repair our buildings, our bridges, our institutions long before we repair our souls. Well, the most important thing in post-conflict situation is to change what's in people's minds and hearts. And it's the most difficult thing, and it takes the longest time. Mm. And so it hasn't happened yet in Northern Ireland, but it will if the peace holds. Sir Kim, we're here tonight talking about breaking down stereotypes, and they have sat the representative of Her Majesty's government as far away possible <laughs> from the representative of the Boston Globe. But leaving that aside, <laughs> 
I have great respect for the Boston Blue, I want you to know. I'm sure. Uh, one thing, the other thing I heard when, in the North last week when I was up there, um, Brexit. And a lot of concerns, uh, uh, more uncertainties. I think there's, people talk, there's, it's, it's almost a done deal that customs checkpoints have to go up, and checkpoints in, in, in that part of the world don't go over well. T talk to us about that if you can. How much, how many, uh, how much of the fear about Brexit <clears throat> and what it will do to the North vis-a-vis -vis the South and vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between the UK and the EU from here on in. Talk about what are real fears and what are just uncertainties. A question about Brexit. Who would have guessed it, eh? Um, look, first of all, I understand why uh, people who watch this process, which you know, uh, dominates the, the British media um, every day and occasionally makes it way, its way across the Atlantic here, yeah. why people get concerned when they track the ups and downs of this process. It was always going to be a difficult negotiation, uh, complicated and painful, because after all, we are leaving uh, a club that is surprised that we, we decided to, to leave. And uh, we are trying to unravel 40 odd years of integration, so it's complicated. Actually, we are making uh, more progress than I think we are given credit for. There are three parts to this negotiation. First part was exit arrangements, the exit bill, the conditions of Brits living in Europe and Europeans living in the UK. That's done. Um, the second part was negotiating a transitional um, period which will run from March 2019 to the end of 2020, and that's now done. It was done by the Prime Minister two weeks ago at a European summit, and we're now on to the negotiations about the future relationship between the UK and uh, the EU after we've left. Um, and I've not mentioned the, the, the Northern Ireland border issue so far, but this is one of the key aspects of the negotiations. And by the way, the Prime Minister has said publicly several times that there is no, uh, no possibility, no way in which we are going to see a hard border um, put in between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And, I mean, the words that she has used amount to a guarantee. Uh, and that's an absolutely firm British government position, and it's inconceivable that we would, we would now uh, not deliver on that. That begs the question of how we're going to do it, and that's where I can see that it's difficult to give you a definitive answer because it depends on the nature of the relationship we eventually establish uh, with the European Union after we've left. But here, what the Prime Minister has said, what the government has said, is that we want a, a, a deep um, uh, agreement uh, relationship with, with the European Union future with, at its centre, a comprehensive free trade agreement. Um, and basically what that means is we would like to keep borders as open as possible, we would like to keep trade flowing as freely as possible, we would like to keep markets as open as possible. The closer we get to that objective, the more straightforward the issue about, uh, about um, goods flowing across the, um, the border in Ireland becomes. So if we get what we want in terms of um, uh, our own trade relationship with, uh, with Europe, we will actually deliver also um, a, a very good outcome on, um, on what happens on that border. But whatever the negotiation um, uh, leads to, one way or another we are going to find a solution that does not involve any physical infrastructure on that border, does not involve any sort of hard border. That's something that the government has committed to openly and there's no way we are going back on that. So that's the bottom line assurance uh, for the Irish people. Good done. Dr. Leviathan, I wanted to ask you kind of a follow-up on this. One thing I got a sense from talking, not just this recent trip, but other trips, is that there was a sense in terms of equality, and when it came to uh, equality under the law, there was a belief that the EU offered greater protections on those issues than would, say, Westminster. Um, I don't know if you agree with that, um, but maybe you could talk a little about that, how important the law has been in the 20 years that have followed to push um, equality along. To, for example, to, to create a police force that in, in the police service of Northern Ireland 
that more broadly reflects the population itself. So I, I was thinking, reflecting on what uh, Senator Mitchell was saying um, earlier, how the Good Friday Agreement enabled the peace uh, in Northern Ireland. And I want to say that from a legal perspective, the Good Friday Agreement is nothing short of a legal work of art. That's what it is. It really implemented power sharing in the most amazing way. Um, but the critics 20 years down the line, academic critics of this uh, model, um, are arguing that it was kind of a freezer because it essentially created um, power sharing for post-conflict society, but it managed to, to uh, implement um, an equal society that is separated. And that's what you have seen um, even last month. Um, but I think that criticism takes a macro level perspective, which is limited. It's kind of like an architect that is looking at a bridge or a house and is saying, can this um, stand the test of time or can this stand a shock like Brexit? And as academics, we should be able to take a micro level perspective as well, explaining that unlike a bridge or unlike a house, um, legal documents are not stagnant, are not um, constant. And we're sitting here at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute, so the US Constitution comes to mind immediately, and we, as, um, we you know, in the United States like, like to call it a living document. And in that sense, I think the Good Friday Agreement is the same. It is a living document given the fact that it is operated by humans, by human beings. So taking that micro level perspective enables us to think about it as if there is an appetite for peace in Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement is what they, all they need. They don't need any more than that. And I think I'll close by maybe paraphrasing Marcel Proust. You said we have to stand on the shoulders of giants. So I stand on, this, on his shoulders and say that I think the voyage for discovery in uh, Northern Ireland is not in seeking new legal grounds or new power sharings or new documents like that, but in having new eyes. Thank you. Sean, I want to ask you, just I guess from a Dublin perspective, is there a concern when you look north and see that 20 years on, the DUP and Sinn Féin are sort of engaged in kind of the old zero-sum game that, um, you know, they both kind of, could, they're the ones that are controlling what goes on and the other parties seem to be looking on, and obviously I'll ask Steve a little more on that, but does that concern you the way that, the fact that, you know, the, gov the, the assembly has been, has been suspended now for over a year? Yes, it does, clearly. Uh, at the same time, I would have a rough rule of thumb in peace processes, echoing George's Vulcan experience. If people feel the institutions governing them are unjust, that's the only thing they will talk about, how the institutions are reformed. But even when you get to that point, the last frontier is changing the attitudes. And that takes, roughly speaking, another generation. And I think that, that is happening in Northern Ireland. It's an argument for patience. I'd make the more general point, and echoing what uh, Dr. Leviton said, Good Friday Agreement is effectively a culmination. It, it is an, there is a one world of difference between a process of change where everybody agrees the rules and a process of change where those rules do not apply and a great achievement of the Good Friday Agreement. It put a process of rules into the fluid situation in Northern Ireland where we cannot be sure whether Northern Ireland will remain forever part of the United Kingdom or eventually perhaps vote to, to join some form of, of Irish unity. The rules are there, there's no need to reinvent them. The last point I'd make, and this is why I wouldn't exaggerate our concern about what's happening. There is so much of the Good Friday Agreement that is actually a permanent achievement. If you think of what happened 100 years ago, all of the events that shaped our island, the treaty, partition, Stormont, the first oil, the war of independence, all of these things, the treaty and 
subsequent developments brought a degree of agreement and stability. But it was much more of a standoff than it was a settlement. That is to say, everybody accepted it with reservations. There were loose ends which proved very ominous for the future. But I would see the Good Friday Agreement being a decisive step on the journey from standoff to settlement. As George said rightly, it doesn't provide peace and stability, but it is the enabling condition. If you think of what it has brought, not just lives saved, if you think of achievements that even in the afterglow of the Good Friday Agreement, we'd have thought doubtingly you'd ask me the day after, what about the police? I would have said, that's the biggest mountain that has to be climbed and I'm not sure they'll get there. But in fact, the police in Northern Ireland is now probably less controversial than it is in our jurisdiction, probably sure, in American jurisdiction. That is an enormous achievement. There are institutions that are up and running. Brexit is clearly a dangerous game changer. If you look at simple things like agriculture, much of the beef and, and milk from Northern Ireland is processed in the south. Much of pig meat from the south is processed in the north. Some of that is time critical. The perfect frictionless border remains to be invented. So it's very much our hope in Ireland because we will be the, be the biggest victims of Brexit. It's very much our hope that the accommodation between the British government and the European Union will allow the freedom of the, the, the border to remain. I used to sum up, and I'll finish on this, the, the process we were involved in is in Northern Ireland, substituting for the either or that was poisoning the place, the and, and, you can be Irish and British, North and or South, neither. or neither, exactly. Brexit, unfortunately, brings a, a new set of classifications that could be at the wrong end of the spectrum, very generous at the right end of the spectrum, probably won't make too much difference. But it's so uncertain that probably the single biggest worry in Dublin at the moment is what is Brexit going to mean for Northern Ireland? Steve, I want to ask you sort of a follow-up from what I just asked Higgy. Um, the moderate parties like you, uh, the Ulster Unionists and the SDLP, which led their respective communities uh, in the 20 years, those roles have flipped, and now the Democratic Unionists uh, are the predominant party for uh, Unionist slash Protestant folks, and Sinn Féin is clearly the dominant party for Catholic slash nationalist folks. How do moderates get a bigger piece of the pie and a little more influence in this, particularly when you see that the DUP and Sinn Féin don't look like they're rushing to go to the dance together right now? Um, thank you very much indeed for that question. Um, I think uh, to being described as a moderate is a great thing because I really enjoy that. You know, normally at these events I tend to be what we call the only unionist in the village. And it's great being here in Boston again and actually talking to such a great audience. And just before I answer that question, one of the things I would like to say is this is the 20th anniversary, but I would also like uh, our party leader at the time, David, David Trimble, Trimble, as well as John Hume, their contributions to the peace process have been absolutely extraordinary. And I sense in many of the discussions that are going on at the moment, not here, but in other places, there seems to be a tendency to write out the history of what David Trimble and my party did at the time and the immolation that went through our party to the position we are now. Because the reasons we are moderate is because we made that position in transitioning for peace. Now, the question in Northern Ireland is quite complex because if you listen to the media, you come with the assumption that there are vast groups of people who vote for the DUP and vast groups of people who vote for Sinn Féin. The reality in the electorate is 18% of the electorate vote for the DUP, 18% vote for Sinn Féin, 30-odd percent vote for the moderates, but the largest group are the none of the bubs and the people who don't come out and vote at all. And it's those people who have become disengaged with the political process is where the future we need to have to be and where we need to be able to grow and develop Northern Ireland going into the future. And it's how we reach out to those people and how we make them become engaged in the political situation. Because, you know, we're talking about the 20th anniversary of the Belfast Agreement. The one thing that has changed Northern Ireland politics in one way wasn't that agreement, but it was, of course, it was the St. Andrews Agreement when the designation from the first and second 
for the designation for the first and deputy first minister went from the largest groupings to the largest parties. And in essence, that entirely sectarianized the process. And one of the things we as a party would like to see is for us to get back to the Belfast Agreement, get away from where we were the St. Andrews Agreement, because the system needs to have checks, balances, and controls. And unfortunately, at the moment, there's neither of those. That's where we need to get to, and that'll bring the middle ground back. Uh, the future, he mentioned. Um, Shannon, you are the future. How old were you when the agreement happened? One and a half. So you, oh, you didn't vote, okay. Um, 96. So tell me, as a young person who has grown up knowing nothing but peace, um, what's good, what's bad, what do you see down the road? Um, I'm lucky in the sense that I come from quite a, we were talking about it earlier, it's kind of like a 50-50 place, you know, you've got your far radicals, but you've also got level-headed people, so you say I've come from peace, but like I've never known uh, destruction like what it was back then, but at the same token, there's still like tribal politics going on where I live, and um, it's still, you know, back and forth, Protestants versus Catholics, not to the extent it once was. Um, I'm from a, like a small enough town, so, uh, you know, we can... It's, you know, it only, it doesn't go further than our town kind of thing. Like, no one would ever pick up a gun or anything. It's not like it ever was. But um, right now, what I can see, the Good Friday Agreement meaning to anyone my age and anyone within Northern Ireland, Protestant or Catholic, um, it's really staying true to honouring the culture um, of Ireland. So I'm a big believer in the Irish Language Act and honouring, um, you know, where we all came from, as Senator George Mitchell said, remember where you came from, and uh, the Good Friday Agreement should honor that. Uh, so. Um, I'd ask you specifically, do you think your generation is less sectarian than the generation before? Oh, 100%. Like, um, I say that there's tribal politics and everything, but we're still very level-headed. I'd say it's much more educated um, generation than what it was once was. Um, you know, we can talk without picking up a weapon. We can discuss things. Um, I have plenty of unionist friends that, you know, it's good to sort of keep yourself on your toes. Um, we're just sort of coming into the 21st century. And I think that's where it needs to be right now. So people are less concerned about Protestants versus Catholics. They're more concerned about, you know, including the LGBT community, we're sure. in the 21st century, and I think uh, any talks happening between the parties right now should be thinking about that and not thinking about, you know, um, what once divided us. It should be what now includes everyone mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland. Marty, speaking of which, um, the greatest integrator <clears throat> in Northern Irish society for many years was higher education, uh, very often when kids met at Queens or the University of Ulster, it would be the first time that a Catholic kid or a Protestant kid might hang out in the same student union or just get to know each other. But what more can higher education do in Northern Ireland? Um, and given, I, 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 Sir Kim's gonna kill me at the end of this because Brexit keeps popping in my head. I was in, in Letterkenny, for example, and the Technology Institute there, the, uh, m a lot of the students come from Derry and from Anna, and, and they're terrified. They think that somehow Brexit is going to affect them, that, they're, that it's just not going to be as easy to get across the border. That, that sort of, and I heard what S Sir Kim said, and I accept it, and I heard what the Prime Minister said, and I accept it, but the fears are real on the ground. But I'm just wondering, in a, in a broader context, what what higher education on both sides of the border could do to facilitate reconciliation and get us beyond just the peace. You know, it's interesting, Kevin. I think I spent 14 years in the Congress, traveled around the world, got very involved in Northern Ireland, and, and got to realize that the United States can play an extremely important role and, in fact, had a leadership responsibility around the world. But then when I got into higher education, 
and set up partnerships when I was at UMass Lowell, not just in Northern Ireland, but, but all across the world, the Middle East, uh, South Africa. I believe higher education is absolutely critical to help uh, bridge uh, divides, specifically in, in Northern Ireland. I believe that economics is critically important. I think of the height of the troubles, and there were 123,000 people in the Northern Ireland un unemployed today. It's down to 28. Uh, thousand or so. Uh, there are 800, last month, 850,000 people employed. I believe universities collaborating uh, through economic development can make a dramatic impact. Looking, and I think American partnerships uh, in Northern Ireland with universities are critically important. And we have partnerships at UMass uh, with all parts of the island. And, and I think it's critically important. The other point that I would make is economic development is not something that every country in the world fundamentally understands. The role of public-private partnerships in interacting with business and industry. Universities can facilitate that. And, and, and so I think that's our role in higher education. And, uh, and there are some great institutions in, in the Republic in, in, in Northern Ireland. And I think it's critically important. And to the extent that there are more partnerships with UMass, or other institutions to the extent that we bring our academic development expertise, research expertise, uh, research in those technologies that have a high likelihood of commercialization that create new companies, create jobs, it's key. Before we go on to uh, Mark Campbell, who is a business representative here, I just want to mention that uh, I think they'll be passing cars around, or have they passed cars around? And you can put questions um, on those cards, do not ask Senator Mitchell anything about the Red Sox, because we will not get out of here. Um, so Mark, go on to that. Um, I, I'm assuming you agree with everything Marty just said, but I would go on and ask you, one of the things in the 20 years that has followed uh, the Good Friday Agreement, the balance of the economy in the North of Ireland has still relied heavily on the Exchequer. Um, the, the growth of, of the inward defense uh, uh, investment and the growth of private industry as opposed to government subsidized jobs and industry has been slower than a lot of people would want. So maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, no, thank you, Kevin. And, and that's, that's very true and, and very accurate. And um, to our mind, very simplistically, politicians have two main functions in life. Um, the first function is to protect the people from foreign domestic harm. That's funny. I thought it was taxes, but go on. And the, the second function is to develop the economy because the, the economy creates the wealth that everything else flows from. And those are absolutely fundamental. Um, and as we look at our economy now, we have developed, but it is not in a particularly strong position. And we, we need, I think, further support and investment. And Invest Northern Ireland and Intertrade Ireland help greatly in that. But you should know, uh, by way of example, the economy today, the British government provide unsung £10 billion per year to the Northern Ireland economy. That's beyond the tax take, £10 billion extra. So since the Good Friday Agreement was signed, that's £200 billion, nearly $300 billion, almost a third of a trillion dollars, into an economy with a population of 1.8 million people. By comparison, if you look at the economy in the South, which was revolutionized in a very positive way by EU money, um, the EU contributed about 40 billion euro to a population of 4.8 million and revolutionized it. So our economy is developing, it is strengthening, but we need to go a great deal further. Um, and on the point of Brexit, Sir Kim, forgive me, coming back to that, um, we do not need a border. Uh, of any substance. Um, I was a soldier in a previous life. I patrolled that border. It is 300 miles long. It is 200 vehicle track accesses to it and numerous where four-wheel drive vehicles and so on could go across. In most of the world, smuggling is a criminal offence. In Ireland, smuggling is an art form. <laughs> and if you create the circumstances to allow smuggling to occur, that is exactly what will occur. But if we look at Brexit and the commitments of the British government and, and, and Europe, there is threat, but there's also great opportunity in Brexit. There's huge opportunity to revolutionize the Northern Ireland economy. And if we could create the circumstances where a special, uh, special conditions were created, which were common to the EU and common to the UK, 
whereby a, a vehicle, a manufactured in Northern Ireland vehicle, would allow goods to flow unhindered into Europe and into the UK, we be could become a magnet for global manufacturing, manufacturing from Ireland and manufacturing from the UK. We have achieved peace, but we haven't achieved reconciliation, and that's going to take time and a great deal of time. And we're very grateful for what Senator Mitchell has done. And I'm also mindful that Senator Mitchell's very first engagement in Northern Ireland was on an economic basis. And the future will be driven by positive economics. And there's an opportunity in Brexit right now which we're not seizing. And we need to get our politicians engaged and to seize that because there is real opportunity to be had. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think I'll direct this at Sir Kim and um, Sean. One thing that always struck me that was maybe a lost opportunity when everybody was at the table and the governments were both obviously fully engaged in the, in the peace process is to create a mechanism by which the football associations on both sides of the border would become one and that Ireland would play in all soccer tournaments as one team. And so you would have people in Dingle cheering for the same team that guys in a Rangers supporters club on the Shankill Road would. Was that, am I Pollyannish? Is that a missed opportunity? Shall I start? Um, Football is very deep waters, you know. Um, interestingly, um, the sport that I played at school, um, rugby union, is unified. Right. Exactly. And the Irish team are embarrassingly good at the moment. And thrashed England on our home turf. It was very enjoyable that day, actually. <laughs> I watched every minute of it, by the way, with a group of Irishmen, so I had the great pleasure of congratulating them all afterwards, which is you know, always a, a nice thing to do. And um, uh, it works extraordinarily well. As I say, the Irish team is, is amazingly strong at the moment. Um, comes to football, though, it's not just that you have an, uh, an Irish Republic team and a Northern Irish team. You also have um, a Wales team and a Scotland team and an England team. Mm -hmm. And this, it's because we invented the game back when, and that's how it was set up, and it's just too difficult um, to, um, to change it. Maybe it's a missed opportunity, um, but uh, I suspect that um, the success recently of the Irish um, rugby team may have had quite a, a very positive effect on, uh, on Ireland. It certainly um, impressed the rest of us. I, uh, we should also note that the captain of the Irish team is a northern prod named Rory Best. He's a great guy. <laughs> he is. He's a Sean, a tremendously good player. Very little to add, but I suspect Senator Mitchell, from his sport involvement, will know that the Blazers, as they call them, the officials in, go in be it golf or any sport, are a law unto themselves. And you will negotiate with Mr. Putin probably more readily than you will negotiate <laughs> with the <laughs> FAI. So, uh, it would be, it'd be a wonderful thing. And as Sir Kim said, the rugby is a wonderful advertisement. It's not pooled effort. It was always a unified team. But certainly, it's, it's a wonderful advertisement for cooperation in that area. Um, the, the, the last judgment and then agreement between the football associations, I suspect. <laughs> so don't hold your breath. It might have been harder. George, I'd like to ask you this. It's, um, I remember asking it. Um, it's interesting how much um, <clears throat> the people or the politicians in South Africa played a role. Um, the Africans uh, being often in the sort of same mold as unionists and then the ANC people, particularly Mandela, playing a role with... I remember Martin McGuinness told me, he said that Mandela told him something that seemed so obvious. He said, you don't make peace with your friends. I mean, you don't, yeah, you don't make peace with your friends, you make peace with your enemies. And in that context, I remember asking a lot of different politicians, whether it's David Trimble, John Hume, Jerry Adams, um, whether it made sense to have a Truth and Reconciliation com uh, Commission modeled on the one in South Africa, which by many accounts seemed to push the reconciliation process in a very vicious, bitter conflict along. I mean, what do yes. you think about that? Uh, I spoke at uh, Quinnipiac University with Senator Murphy in Connecticut just a couple of nights ago, and that issue arose. And there were very 
powerful emotional arguments on both sides. The key to remember, to keep in mind in that debate, is that the South Africa Truth and Reconciliation Commission was successful primarily because the government granted total amnesty to any person who came forward and testified as to wrongdoing. You will arouse the most intense emotions in Northern Ireland on that issue. Correct. In North Haven, Connecticut, just three nights ago, I heard both sides of it. And my own view is, and it's based on experience, when the Good Friday Agreement was reached on April 10th. It was, by its terms, not self-executing. There had to be a referendum. That was held on May 22nd. Both the governments asked me to return and to participate in the campaign to obtain a yes vote. And I had many meetings with organizations of victims of the violence. They were deeply emotionally opposed to the agreement because the agreement includes a provision establishing a process for the potential early release of prisoners who had been convicted of violent crimes in the conflict. To those prisoners and the parties who are at the negotiating table, they compared themselves to George Washington's army at Valley Forge. They were, in their minds, patriots. But in the minds of the people who lost a father or a son or a daughter or a child, as a result of their action, they were murderers. And they should not have been released. I don't believe I persuaded a single person in that category to vote for the agreement. I believe I did enable them to understand that if they wanted no others in the future to endure what they had gone through, the agreement was essential. But opposition to the agreement to this day, rests on that issue. And I emphasize the point of it, it's not just the deaths, it's the still living men, mostly, but some women, who've spent a lifetime incapacitated because of the extreme brutality of the punishment beatings. So I don't think this issue can and should be decided by anyone other than the people of Northern Ireland. I don't think any American or anybody from the United Kingdom or any outside place can come in and say to them, you have to do this. It is up to them. And they are deeply divided on the subject. So you have to be very careful about it. And, and their view is understandable. Put yourself in that position. Someone walks into the table and by swearing an oath gains immunity and describes how he murdered your wife or your child. Uh, it, it's a very, very hard thing to accept. And, and it, has its, it had its benefits in South Africa, but many other post-conflict societies have refused to proceed with it for the reason I've just suggested. It's just too difficult, and it reopens old... And I had a man say to me in, in, uh, in North Haven, Connecticut, he said... My father was murdered. He said, I don't want this whole issue reopened. He said, it's best left. And we'll try to get justice as we can, but we recognize that it's limited. So it's a controversial issue. Uh, and and I, I think, again, it's got to be decided by and only by the people of Northern Ireland themselves. I should have noted that... Um the involvement of the South Africans in the peace process was very much the work of Parag O'Malley, 
who's an Irish-born academic here at the University of Massachusetts at Boston and uh, should be recognized for, yeah, for the work I he did. Could I just add a comment on that? Mm -hmm. The South Africans were very helpful, mm -hmm. and I'll make two comments. A group of Northern Ireland political officials were invited to South Africa to meet with President Mandela. And they were so divided that they wouldn't sit together at the meeting. And Mandela went into each room and he scolded both groups. He said, here you are in South Africa where we have been able to sit together and you can't sit together. And he forced them to get in to the same room together. And the other contribution, and this is a powerful statement, came from de Klerk. De Klerk said, the hardest part of getting a peace agreement is not sitting across the table from your adversary and reaching a compromise. The hardest part is after that, you go back to your community and you tell them you're not going to get 100% of what you want. That's where the real leadership is required. That's why I said earlier that the leaders of Northern Ireland, and you mentioned David Trimble. David was foremost among them. The Ulster Unionists had a full-day caucus on that day. I, I distributed the final agreement early that morning, and through the day, there were then eight parties left in the process. The DUP had walked out earlier, and the UKUP, so there were eight parties. And I spent the entire day in communication with them, and gradually starting about one in the afternoon, yes, yes, yes. The LCU unions had a bitter discussion, a long discussion. They had questions. They, they asked Blair to come in. And it wasn't until 10 minutes of five that Trimble called me and said they were prepared to proceed. And I called a vote for, two, for five because I didn't want to. I learned as majority leader, when you got the votes, vote. But Trimble's career ended then and there, when he reached the agreement. And so, as you said correctly, he and John Hume deserved the Nobel Peace Prize because John Hume conceived the architecture of the negotiations. He conceived the notion of three separate, what they call, strands. The relationship between Northern Ireland and Ireland, the relationship between Ireland and the UK, and internal to Northern Ireland, the relationship between unionists and nationalists. And it was that architecture that John Hume conceived and created that actually made it possible for us to pull the whole thing together. And so they, they, they were crucial leaders. And as I said, Trimble's career ended. John's continued, but his party's position declined in parallel with that with of the Elster Unionists. You know, but my favorite part of the, uh, the South African stories that Parag told me, the difficulty of getting them in the rooms in the first place, is that when he brought them into a place in South Africa, Peter Robinson, who was then the deputy leader of the DUP, came out storming and said, this is unfair, this is unfair, the Shinners have nicer rooms than us. And Parag said, that's not true, Peter, you, you have all the same similar rooms. He goes, well, they have a mini bar. <laughs> and and Parag goes, Nobody in the DUP drinks. He goes, that's not the point. <laughs> anyway, oh, yeah. I think we're going to move it on to question and answer time. Um, so where are the cards? Oh, hello. You scared me. Jesus. Um, this comes from Oscar Time from Lancaster in the UK, a good part of the UK. How do you feel the recent deal between the conserva this conservative government and the DUP will impact the peace in Northern Ireland? I guess I'd throw that at Steve. Um, I think when we look at the deal between the sort of the DUP and the conservatives, and speaking as a political party, we have had lots of experiences of trying to deal with a conservative party. There are two things. One, I don't think that the Conservatives realise what they're getting with the DUP. And two, I don't think the DUP realises what they're getting with the Conservative Party. <laughs> um, 
the reality is that it is a marriage of convenience. And when that convenience is no longer there, it will separate. Uh, the real issue we have in Northern Ireland at the moment is another relationship that needs to be repaired. And that's the relationship between London and Dublin. That is the key relationship that has gone astray. And just using the Brexit word again, until we can get relationships between London and Dublin, and particularly at the highest level restored, we're not going to get anywhere with Northern Ireland. And that is probably the biggest uh, impediment to getting Northern Ireland back on track again, not the sort of the DUP conservative mutual non-loving. Sean, would you agree with that? Well, I don't see the relationship being that damaged. The, there is a, an enormous problem that Brexit has ramifications right throughout the island. I don't mean to be critical of the British government in any direct way in, in Sir Clement's presence, but it is almost impossible to, to discern what they're aiming for, what they're going for. There are an enormous number of babies in the Brexit water, so to speak, which are going to be salvaged, which are going to be thrown out. It, it, it is an, an existential difference for us. We cannot disguise that. We cannot pretend to be aligned with the British policy that we, don't, we cannot even define. We have a, an enormous interest in Britain having a good relationship with the European Union. The ideal one would be to stay a member. The further Britain is removed from the European Union, the worse it is for us in all kinds of ways. But it is very difficult because Brexit is obviously the dominant concern in the British government at the moment. It is very difficult for us to have a dialogue where we do not have any idea what the real lineaments of the Brexit policy is, and that has been interpreted as a source of some tension. It's not. It's an attempt to find a roadmap on this absolutely unprecedented landscape that threatens everything to some degree, even the Good Friday. I don't mean that people will go for their balaclavas again, not in that simplistic way, but the and and diffusing all these differences gets an enormous setback if effectively Britain and Ireland are separated by the chasm of two completely different systems. And the British unfortunately have a, a vast idea of the flexibility of the European Union and think that if the European Union are not being flexible, it's, it's vengeance and punishment. It's not the European Union is trying to keep the cohesion that is there and it's not an unconditional. They're, they want, obviously, partnership with Britain. The ideal for everybody in Europe would be that Britain should not leave. That's not now on offer. After that, the minimum possible. But what Steve thinks of as tension between the two governments, I see as more perplexity. I mean, how do you get a handle on such a vastly important policy where the government that's the main protagonist hasn't really, that anyone can discern, really defined realistic objectives from this. But uh, as I said, it's not hostility, it's perplexity, I think. This question, um, I think, would be best for Shannon, given she mentioned this earlier. It's from Joanne Golden of South Weymouth, Weymouth, Mass. And the question is, how can the Irish Language Act be used to unite unionists and nationalists rather than divide them? Um, thank you for that question. Um, so the Irish Language Act, the way I see it and the way I think everyone should sort of see it, we all live on the same island. This, like, um, people who think it's not their culture or the Irish Language Act doesn't involve them, it most certainly does. Um, I think over the past 100, 150 years of history, it sort of got lost and it's been nationalized and it's been a part of a republic movement, but that shouldn't be the case. It should be in, like inclusive. I think it's Queen's University that actually has classes and it's open to Protestants, it's open to everyone. And I actually think there's a good few Protestants that actually attend those classes. So it shouldn't be just Republicans or nationalists that um, use the Irish language. People might say it's a dead language, but whenever you think of the culture and the history that it has behind it, it means an awful lot to, it should mean an awful lot to everyone on the island. Um, and it's inclusive of 
Gaelic football. It's inclusive of, you know, just the history of Ireland in general, which every single person here should be proud of. And, you know, we should take in our stride. It's something that I love to hear. I was once on a night out here in Boston and a fella turned around to me and goes, Gia Ditch. And I was like, how do you know that? Uh, and he had no, nothing towards Ireland. He has no uh, Irish connections. He just, he went to Dublin one time and he loved the language. He, it was a novelty, some would say, but um, to many more people, it's not just a novelty. It's, it's their life. It's um, both University of Ulster and Queen's. A deliver a Irish language degree, so it's a lot of people's, um, you know, meaning of, or you know, meaning and their way to make money. So everyone should think of it not as a political thing, but as an identity thing, and to keep that identity, um, you know, unified. And it's a way of maybe unifying unifying the people instead of separating them in later um, years. It's all. Well, thank you. Um, it's always struck me how few Irish people, both North and South, know that it was the Ulster Presbyterians who did so much to maintain the language, particularly in the North, during the uh, 19th century. It's just something that got lost because of the politicization of the, the language. Um, I'm trying to think who this is best for, and it's the name, there's no name filled in, but it's a pretty good question. So. I think I'll, I'm gonna throw this out to um, Dr. Livetan, because she knows her law. Would the agreement, would the good No, I don't think so. <laughs> but um, is, is then again, who envisioned the UK not being in the, in the EU 15 months ago? So, um, um, and it's a moot question as far as at this point because uh, Britain has a role, regardless of being in the EU as part of the, good, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Um, and it's, it's pertinent and important that she continues that role um, with the uh, Irish government. But I wonder if I can ask uh, Senator Mitchell a short question. Is that possible? Hey, you can do anything you want, Doctor. <laughs> because it's I was just wondering, still. thinking through these 1990s that you have been, early 1990s, one of the things that comes out in the literature is um, Northern Irish is, is the, the pressure by, um, by the EU, by the United States, thinking through the um, um, South Africa being resolved, and at that point thinking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict being resolved in the early 1990s um, with the Camp David Agreement. And I'm wondering, you as a peace builder, looking back 20 years ago, could you envision that the only conflict that would stay unsolved at that point, at this point in history, would be another conflict and not the Northern Irish conflict in the early 1990s when you started in the negotiations. Is that to me? Yeah. I, I, I didn't comprehend the full question. Can you repeat it, Kevin? The question is, no, where did I put it? Uh, could, no, it's a new question. No, her question. Her question? Yeah. Oh, I didn't listen. You didn't listen. Oh, I'm sorry. Just, just summarize, summarize it yes. slowly again. Would you have envisioned, I'm sorry, would you have envisioned that the only conflict that would stay unsolved in the early 1990s would be a different conflict than the Northern Irish when you started negotiating it? And that would be the Israeli-Palestinian one among the big three at that point. I, I must confess to you, when I was in Northern Ireland, uh, it was so difficult, uh, so demanding and of every moment of my time and energy that I really didn't give much thought to Israelis or Palestinians or anybody else. Uh, and so I, I never did contemplate that question. I will, however, answer a question you didn't ask and say that uh, when I finished after five years, 
I thought it was by far the most difficult thing I'd ever encountered in my life, other than being Senate Majority Leader. Then uh, President Clinton asked me to go to the Middle East. And so just a couple of years ago, to a large group of Irish Americans in Queens, New York, I said, I'm about to say something I never thought I would believe, let alone say. But five years with the Irish, and then after six months with the Israelis and the Arabs, the Irish were a bunch of patsies. Yeah. <laughs> they were easy to deal with. Uh, the, I'm asked a lot about the two. The Israeli-Palestinian issue is far more complicated for a whole variety of reasons, not the least of which is that the, the Northern Ireland issue and the UK is literally isolated. It's a group of islands all by itself. There are no uh, very few, there were very few external factors or actors. In the Middle East, it's a common era in our country and in much of the West to view the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in isolation from the region and the surrounding events in the country. It is enormously impacted by those events and it in turn impacts those events. And they are much more complicated. There are many, many more actors. There are numerous overlapping, intersecting, sometimes contradictory conflicts. The divisions within Islam are deep. Uh, and so uh, there are so many other actors, so many other factors, so many other controversies that, th that serve as huge restraints on progress. I'll give just one of, literally, I could give you hundreds of examples. Each of the issues between Israelis and Palestinians is complicated. The Palestinians have a free hand in dealing with the Israelis on every issue except one. They can decide the borders for themselves. They can accept or reject Israelis' proposals on the right to return. But on the most difficult, complex issue of all, Jerusalem, the Palestinians do not have a free hand. Jerusalem is a Muslim issue. And of the 1.7 Muslim, billion Muslims in the world, only 400 million are Arab and fewer than 5 million are Palestinians. The Saudis must approve, the Jordanians must approve, the Moroccans must approve, and all of the, the, even Iran as the Shia, the leader of the Shia. So you can't even think of an agreement on Jerusalem unless you involve everybody. That simply was not the case in Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, the issues, while painful, sectarian, and difficult, Sean spent his whole life dealing with them, nonetheless, they were clear to everyone and, and each of the actors in their capacity had the authority to make an agreement subject to a referendum. So it's a lot tougher in the Middle East. It's okay. more complicated. A final, a final quick question. It comes from Alan Fagan, a Dubliner now living in Andover. I know the answer to this question, but I want you to say it. Senator Mitchell, you talked in your book about visiting the assembly someday with your son, Andrew. Did you ever get that opportunity? I did, uh, and let me explain to those, the vast majority who haven't read my book, <laughs> that's, that's, that's book. true in every audience I ever speak to. <laughs> um, it was a very difficult and painful process, much of it highly negative, mostly failure, uh, and after the first couple of two and a half years, uh, I thought for the first and only time about leaving and not returning. I'd been asked every day by the press, as Steve knows they have very aggressive press in Northern Ireland, Senator, you failed, when are you going home? There were many cheering for me to say yes tomorrow, some not. Uh, 
But in October of 1997, my wife gave birth to our son. And all the parents here know your life, your responsibilities and your obligations change when you have children. Before, my wife's an independent person. She worked. It was difficult, but I could leave and be gone for months, and she was all right. But now that I had a son, I thought differently. So I got back home literally, unbelievably, just as my wife was getting ready to go to the hospital, and I was there for his birth. On the first day, I, I sat in the hospital room thinking about what we wanted for my son, just what every parent here has thought about their children. And it's, uh, the thought struck me, I wonder how many children were born on Northern Ireland on the same day. And I, I called, uh, it's how long ago, it was a payphone in the hotel a hospital lobby, and I called my staff every day when I was in the U.S. and wow. got a briefing. And uh, I asked Martha, can you find out for me how many babies were born in Northern Ireland today? Well, they keep good records in Northern Ireland, so it didn't take long. It was 61. And so I kept thinking about that. And I had thought about not returning, and I discussed it with my wife, and we talked about the 61 babies, and she strongly urged me to return. She was very direct. She said, if, if you don't go back and the conflict breaks out, you'll never be able to live with yourself. So I did go back, and I said I would call it Andrew's peace when I went back. After we got the agreement that last night, we'd been up, everybody was exhausted, it was very difficult. Uh, several of us gathered and there was a lot of emotion, a lot of tears, a lot of exhaustion. And I said to them that this agreement kept me going for years. Now I've got a new dream and I said someday I'm gonna bring my son, he's just born a few months ago, here and I want to come and I want to sit in a gallery and watch the Northern Ireland Assembly created by this agreement. And they'll be debating the ordinary issues of life in a democratic society. Fisheries, agriculture, health care. There'll be no talk of war because the war will have long been over. No talk of peace because peace will be taken for granted. And When that happens, I'll feel truly fulfilled. Fourteen years later, at the request of the BBC, they made a documentary about it, they found many of the children born on the same day as my son, and my family and I went a couple of years ago, and we spent a week there, and we met four of the children who are the exact same age as my son, born on the same day, and their families. Now, this being Northern Ireland, there was one unionist, one nationalist, one moderate Protestant one, other, anyway, it was, it was the proper political balance. And we had the most wonderful week uh, I've ever had in Northern Ireland. I told my kids, bring your raincoats, bring your caps, it was March, I said, bring your galoshes. For one week we were there, unbelievably not one drop of rain. <laughs> the weather was fantastic. My, my, they didn't believe my, all of my complaining. So it was a great day, and here's how it ended. We went to the gallery, my son and I, nobody else in the gallery, nobody goes and watches the assembly there. And a minister was reading a report from a meeting he had been to in Brussels, as dry as dust, as boring as only a government report read out loud could be. <laughs> but I was captivated. I, I, I thought it was the most wonderful thing I'd heard. My son, then in his teens, sitting next to me, after about a half hour, leans over. He said, Daddy, this is really boring. Can we go now? And I tell that story in Northern, and I say, that's the question for the people of Northern Ireland. Can we go now? Can we let go of the past and go into the future? We've got peace. What we need is prosperity and reconciliation and the two go hand in hand. And I believe that's the challenge in Northern Ireland. Can we go now? George, given what you've given to the people of Ireland, I would say that a, a week of, without rain is the least they could do for you. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. And now. Thank you.
We're going to have uh, Dr. Mary Grant, who is the president of the Kennedy Institute, uh, offer some closing remarks. That's it. Yep, yep. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you to the members of the panel. This has been an enriching and beautiful discussion, and a very special thank you to Senator George Mitchell. How about a round of applause for all of our <laughs> And for those of you who brought your Henry Kissinger posters tonight, I'm sorry to disappoint you. We won't be doing poster signings. Um, but thank you all so much for being here. This is indeed a privilege and an honor to host such a discussion with our partners from the Consulate General of Ireland, the British Consulate General of Boston, and the Irish Network of Boston. What a privilege to have this here this evening. Kevin, when you began to introduce the panel, you talked about uh, the, the impact that Martin Luther King Jr. had on John Hume and the peace process and how we thought about that. And thinking about this week and the loss of another great leader and thinking about tonight's conversation, when I think about Martin Luther King and some of the beautiful words he offered, I think about this evening and one of his quotes of, we must concentrate not merely on the negative expulsion of war, but the positive affirmation of peace. And I think that's what we heard this evening. And the words that came out from all of you on trust and hope and maintaining that path and hanging on, reconciliation, being strong and unwavering, and having people, men and women of courage, joining the political process. That's what it takes, and that's what we do here at the Kennedy Institute as well. We take the next generation of young leaders coming through these doors and inspiring them to have their best and greatest impact. And Shannon, I want to thank you because you're such a reminder of what can happen when we decide we need to make our best difference. Because when you use those words that you can now talk to your friends without picking up weapons, what a visual how positive that is, how hopeful it is, even though there is so much more to be done. So as we leave here this evening, I'm reminded of the words of Senator Mitchell when we think about peace and prosperity, but reconciliation, because when we come together, that's when we indeed do our best and most profound work. So I thank you for coming together here this evening. I hope you will come back again and again and again. Senator Kennedy envisioned this to be a place of the people, a place where people would work across the aisle and have those conversations that change lives. And it is a privilege and an honor to have hosted such a discussion with all of you here who change lives and continue to do so. I thank you for joining us this evening, and I hope that you will come back often. Thank you.